going to start with this first page. Okay, now we've talked about this in one of my first uh, YouTube videos. On your page, you should have an image that looks just like this, but it's got a bunch of blanks. I want you to fill those blanks out with your writing utensil. On my torch video, we talk about how there's the different components of the torch. We have the gas nozzle. We have the collet body inside of here is the collet. We have our tungsten, our gas shields coming out. Our filler, our filler rod for the metal is towards the front edge of the puddle. And you can see this is pretty typical when we're welding with pig. This is the uh, weld area. So we're really only penetrating maybe half the weld size into the base metal. So we're not like putting down a huge thick weld that's going to join very large thick pieces of metal together. All right. And then you have your arc. Again, it's fairly close. This is a good representation of how close you should be to the metal. Um, this is a typical, you don't need to write any notes down for this page, but I just wanted to kind of give you an idea for how a welder, a tube welder is set up. Oftentimes we have our power source, right? Our current is what we adjust, right? Current and amperage are the same synonym, if you will, they're the same meaning. So we're going to adjust our current, and that machine will try and maintain that current. So I've been telling you guys with your beads about 125 amps. The machine does everything it can to maintain 125 amps throughout the, the entirety of your weld. All right. As you get closer or further away, the voltage will vary. We'll talk about why that does uh, that in another day. But your polarity is electronegative. That's an important thing because, again, some machines you have to set up negative and positive. Your torch will always be the negative side of things. And then the work clamp will be, or your work lead, as it puts right here, will be your positive end of things. Sometimes there's a remote, a foot pedal. We talked about that in the YouTube video as well that uh, you sometimes you can add a remote it's kind of like an accelerator in your car zero gas to full gas whatever you set your current at on your machine the foot pedal will allow you to give you all of that or none of it uh, we have two different modes of starting you can use the foot pedal and most of our machines are capable of doing a high frequency start so uh, maybe we'll go out there and do a demonstration later today but you can actually uh, put a foot pedal on a machine, and when you push down on it, it sends a high frequency electrical signal across the arc. It kind of looks like lightning. Uh, a bunch of light, mini lightning bolts that'll try and uh, ignite or initiate the arc. So you never actually have to touch the metal, period. So that's a, that's a pro, right? Because the lifting and touching is somewhat of our issue. But then you have to deal with your foot pedal, which is a third appendage, right? You get your torch, your filler rod, start throwing your foot in the midst of that. Can be a little overwhelming. But whenever you guys are ready to try doing a high frequency start, it does make starting a lot easier. Not welding in general, but it does make starting easier. All right, this is your water cooled torch. This is again a bunch of blanks on your screen, on your paper. You can start filling these in. Uh, the only real difference here, I like the cutaway. From the first picture to this one, I like how you can actually see the collet body and the collet and how the back half is pushing it in to pinch down on the tungsten. Um, so sometimes when you're welding and your tungsten is not staying in because uh, one reason or another the tungsten keeps falling out, it's because of that mechanic. Your tungsten is not being gripped by the collet into the collet body. Okay. Uh, the nozzle, again, we have different types of nozzles, different sizes, different materials. So that helps direct all the shielding gas that comes out of the torch head towards your weld puddle. Okay. Uh, and then the main difference here. Is in the other torch, there's only two leads your gas and your electricity, but now we have three. We have a shielding gas coming in, we have a cold water coming in, and then we have our power 
and our hot water coming out in the same sleeve. And what that does, it actually comes up and around and it circulates around the head of the torch, cooling it down with cold water. Yeah, you may not know this, but your torch that you're using in your booth is really only rated for about 150 amps. If we use that air-cooled torch for much longer than about 10 or 12 minutes at a time over 150 amps, the components will start to break down. It gets really hot, it gets wiggly, a little squishy, and you can melt your torch. The benefit of having a water-cooled torch is uh, the amperage that it's able to withstand is much higher. So you can actually pump out two or 300 amps through a torch and it won't melt on that. All right, so that's a, a definite pro of having something like that, a water-cooled torch. This is on the second page. Uh, these are just some little theory tips, uh, information about TIG welding that I think you're good to know. Um, first off, it was invented back in 1926. That's when the first patent was. And so for something that's been around for almost 100 years, we're getting close to it, um, a lot of people think it's like a brand new welding process or that it's, it's different, right? But it's been around for a long time. Uh, it was called Heliart back in 1942. Uh, one of the reasons why it would drive us to invent this whole process was to reduce weight on World War I bombers. All right, uh, we wanted to get rid of all the mechanical factors, all the rivets holding down seats and stuff like that. So they came up with this idea to try and use the base metal of the seat bracket to weld them to the fuselage using just the base metal bracket and the metal of the fuselage together. So they could ditch the rivet and they were able to shed some weight and help make the plane drive further into the enemy territory. So it is one of the highest quality of the art welding processes. It's super uh, common in aerospace, medical, nuclear. Um, we have a Nestle plant that we're in Springville, and they make a lot of fun, wonderful TV dinners, right? They have a lot of tubing inside that plant that helps pump uh, your ingredients from the big hoppers into your little TV tray. And those tubes have to be like clean, right? And you can't just weld those two together with any welding process and expect a good result. TIG welding is used to make sure those pipings are done so that they're not contaminated with like rust and all sorts of uh, germs. So uh, that's done, an example of what's done with TIG welding. But it's also extremely flexible. We haven't started using the foot pedal yet, but once you start using the foot pedal, you have exactly precise control over your filler rod, how much you're adding. Also, how much amperage, you can make it really hot or really cold, just with a little tap of your foot. You can move faster or slower, so you actually have unlimited control of what you're doing as a, as a welder. When we start jumping into these other welding processes for the rest of the year, you will have that ability to have that control. Okay? Um, our amperage, our current, we're typically uh, around 30 to 150. But machines are capable of going up to 500 plus amps. Your voltage, again, your voltage will be dictated by how far away you are from the metal with your tungsten. So we call that the arc length. And we want to be somewhere between 10 to 12. If you start going above 14 volts, uh, you're starting to get way too far away from the metal. Okay? So while you're welding, have your partner read out your voltage to you, it's just the, it's the only number that's moving on your dial, on the front of your way. Welding speed, 40 inches a minute, I'll be honest, that's more of a mechanical or robotic application. It gives you hard, you'd be a good welder if you're welding pig 40 inches a minute by hand. But typically by hand, we're welding three to six inches a minute. When you start getting the group of things, that's about what you can expect. So when you get those three inch speeds, to go across that plate, it might take you anywhere from 30 minutes, 30 seconds, sorry, 30 seconds to a minute to get a three inch. Okay? So if you feel like you're going too fast, you might even count in your head as you're welding across the plate. And not usually done very on thick material. And a that one is a term that uh, no one's heard before, I guarantee it. 
So that it basically means that we're going to weld without filler. So if you want us to actually do a blood joint or even a lap joint, you can weld the top plate to the bottom plate or the two plates together without using the filler. And as long as it's done well and it's clean and fit up properly, it's just as strong as using filler metal. Okay. All right, here's some definitions. Um, there are uh, different all over the world, depending on certain things. So in uh, America, we call it gas trunks and arc welding because, you know what, we did used to call it pig welding, as it is still called in Europe. But it's more of a slang term now because it stands for tungsten inert gas. But in pig welding, um, sometimes now we're using reactive gas not just an inert or a noble gas. So it didn't really fit the term anymore, so we changed it to gas tanks and arc welding. Uh, over in Germany, they call it Wolfram inert gas. Anyone know what Wolfram is? Yeah! Look at this kid gives an A+. Plus. But most people don't know that if you look at the periodic table, it has all of our raw elements. Tungsten is not a T, but it's a W. Or Wolfram. Uh, the Germans made it to the patent office first when we discovered tungsten way back when, and they named it Wolfram, which means tungsten in German. In German. That's good. Okay. Heliarch is another brand name, kind of like Kleenex. It's a facial tissue, but everyone says it's Kleenex, even though it's a different brand. Heliarch is an Aesop run brand where we use helium originally. And argon arc is also another slang term, but mainly outside. All right, applications for TIG welding again, small components, two to two, like I mentioned in that sanitary piping over at Nestle, or uh, something like that. Um, to sheet metal, all these really tight, intricate stuff, aerospace, piping overlays. Mainly, it's uh, used for any sort of clean welding application. It, it is such a clean and precise process. I can actually jump into a clean suit and go into a clean room, much like you can see a medical field, and I could weld inside that area and I would not contaminate it if my setup was done properly. So, up at the point of the mountain, there's a lot of computer technology companies, right? We actually have a microprocessor company called IM Flash up there in Lehigh. And they make computer chip processors. We can weld with TIG in those plants, in those rooms, and we're not going to damage the processors because of the way our the welding is done with TIG. It's such a clean, precise welding process. The fumes are, are next to none, and the argon uh, helps really protect all the metal. So it's really good. Fantastic welding application. All right, real quick on this one. This is on the bottom of your page. It's a larger slide. Um, again, we want to be electronegative. Your blanks down here are this area. Okay. When the electricity is going negative to positive, we're actually doing more penetrating into the metal. When the electrode is positive and the electricity is going out, it actually cleans the metal. It pulls all the oxides off the plate, but then the uh, uh, tungsten is so hot because that's where all the heat's going, it melts your tungsten. So when you put a sharp point on your tungsten and you're welding electrode positive, it will disappear very quickly. And then if we want to weld, um, both sides on alternating currents, we can actually get a little bit of both. We can get a little bit of cleaning and a little bit of welding. This process right here, AC, is done for aluminum. Aluminum has an oxide layer, like a rust layer on the surface that is kind of difficult to weld. And so we put it on AC so it cleans it on the positive side and then we weld it on the negative side. And then uh, these things down here. Tells you how much heat is in the metal versus the electrode, which I think is it's interesting to know that you can play with where your heat is and how much penetration you can get by just switching the terminal. 
All right, shielding gas. Um, we haven't really talked about why we're using shielding gas just yet, but know that it is, it is critical. Without shielding gas, we're actually not going to do anything productive. So argon is what we're using, almost 100% pure argon. Uh, sometimes you can add other things into it, like uh, hydrogen. Down here at the bottom, you can add a little bit. But typically, uh, we don't use a ton. Helium was used. It does create a hotter arc. But uh, you have to use more of it because it's lighter than air. So you have to increase your flow rate to make sure you have adequate shielding gas. But also, helium is in like a limited production right now. We don't really have a lot of manufacturing plants that are using it as their byproduct, usually the mining field. Anywho, uh, we don't have a lot of helium. And so it's more expensive. Uh, my one bottle of argon is about 50 bucks, and a bottle of helium is about 200. So, and we have, we have to use more of it, it costs four times as much. So, we don't use helium nearly as much. Um, this is a chart, and I just need you to fill in the colors and the classification. All right, so pure tungsten is our element that we find in the earth, right? It's pure raw tungsten. And you wouldn't know what an alloy is? Mixing of two metals, two or more metals, right? Why do we, why do we make alloys? Yeah, we're trying to increase the mechanical properties of the parent metal. All right? Uh, and that comes in a variety of different ways. Adding different metals together can make them more durable, or stronger, or harder. And those different qualities were, we want for a certain reasons. We will alloy tungsten with some of these other metals to maintain a harder material or a stronger material, a higher temperature resisting material. Uh, tungsten, do you even know why we use tungsten? I didn't even talk about this. Why do we, it is the hardest known metal that we have, right? Unobtainium doesn't exist just yet, so it's tungsten. And tungsten, or by, what's the Captain America shield made out of? Vibranium, yeah, that doesn't, doesn't exist. Uh, so anywho, uh, so tungsten is the hardest known metal we have. But if we start alloying it with a few of these other metals that aren't as hard, we can actually increase its strength so it's harder. We can increase its ability to withstand higher temperatures so it stays sharper longer. Um, so pure tungsten, it, the point that you put on it doesn't stay very long at all because it will melt. Um, but these other ones, like we're using gray, this 2% cerium or seriated tungsten, and that is able to keep a point much longer than pure toast. Okay, and we color code them on the back because that actually makes a little bit of a difference on how the arc reacts, depending on which one of these you're using. So we want to make sure we're using the one that we prefer or that we need to use. And just a quick explanation, electrode wolfram pure. Electrode wolfram cerium, 2%. Electrode wolfram lanthanated, 1%. So that's how that classification works. We're talking about an electrode. It's a tungsten electrode, so it's a W, electrode wolfram. And then the P would be pure, or whatever element you put in there would be on this side. Okay? And I think we're all good on that one. That was quick and easy. Uh, this is the, uh, there's no notes on this page that I remember. But this is probably one of the most important pages of our slide. If we take a look at the different arc, uh, sorry, sharpness angles, you can see the variance in how wide or narrow the arc is. And over here we have it drawn up how wide or how deep the well penetration can be. All right, so right now we're just learning, we're practicing. It doesn't really matter a whole lot. But there are certain angles that might be more beneficial for a butt joint, which will do a third well, versus our lap joint, which is what we're doing next. How we're focusing the heat and how wide it's going. This is also why it's really important to sharpen your tungsten when you goober it with a bunch of mild steel from the filler metal to 
because then the arc will start to follow the contour of the bulb on the bottom of your tungsten. So if you were actually to look at how it comes off, it comes off the point directly at 90 degrees, and then it's kind of like a parabola down to the metal. So the straight tungsten, that's just a square end, comes right off. But the 15 degree tungsten comes out and then down. So if you have a big bulb on it, you've got this wider arc coming off the tip. All right? So just know that it, I don't really care what angle you, you grind it at right now, but that, that it does matter in a, in a certain way. So right now we're just kind of getting used to it, so no big deal. Uh, how we're going to get started, we've got that down path now, I hope. Um, again, if you feel like you want to try a foot pedal and try a high frequency start, uh, you no longer have to touch the metal at that point, but you have to insert the remote foot pedal into the control. And I explained how to do that on the YouTube video. Pulsing, uh, this is another one that we, you could get into later on in the term, even when you do your cube. You can actually pulse the amperage to go really, really hot so it gets everything liquid and then quench it but not turn off the arc. And you can set up these pulses to happen once a second or 200 times a second. And it's mainly to control on really thin material uh, not completely melting it into oblivion. But you can get some really nice, pretty effects by using the pulser. And uh, there are a few YouTube videos out there on it. But if you want to try messing around with it, I can show you maybe in a lab after school. Uh, and again, this is a sequencer. Same thing about the pulse a little bit. All right, here's the last. Last little squares on your page. The advantages and disadvantages of feet welding. Once you're done with these two slides, then you're able to put your notes away and we can go well. A little bit longer. We'll get there. Um, the highest of all our qualities, we've talked about that. There's no spatter. Can be used on all metals. Uh, again, probably the number one benefit is precise control over your heat and your filler. You won't have this luxury exactly on any other welding process. You'll be kind of at the mercy of what it's capable of doing. For TIG, you can do, you can control everything. So if you actually look at this picture, it's really tiny, but it's 0.1 amps, and the material thickness is 100,000. And that's the tungsten coming down and lighting up on the edge of that material. Uh, there's a place in Payson called Sunstone Engineering. They do micro TIG welding. Everything's under a microscope. And their largest tungsten is 0 .040 in diameter. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. I went there a few years back and saw what they were doing. Um, but anywho, again, independent control of their heat and the filler. Uh, low fume generation. You'll notice we haven't even turned on the exhaust. Not uh, one day since you guys have been out there because it doesn't, we don't need to. It's just uh, noise pollution at that point. When we start stick welding next term, that fan will always be on. Otherwise, we'll smoke out the whole hallway. Why on earth would you ever not want to stick weld? Well, this one. Super slow. We're talking about making money. Time is money. If I'm only able to weld three inches a minute, um, I'm not making a whole lot of, well, I'm probably still making a lot of money in the welder, but uh, I'm not putting out as many parts that can earn me more money. MIG welding, we can go upwards of 500 inches a minute, and it's handheld. So you can cruise uh, in certain applications and other processes. TIG welding is incredibly sl uh, slow. Tungsten, okay, we've talked about tungsten being the hardest known metal. Who's stuck their tungsten into the metal so far? Yes, that's, that's terrible. Not for learning, but for actual production. Tungsten being the hardest known metal, it doesn't dilute, it doesn't just dissipate, it stays as a rock hard tungsten nugget. So if that piece of metal is now in cycle, in a menu, uh, let's say it's on my car frame, and my car is rolling down the freeway and it's hitting all sorts of bumps and it's flexing. 
that tungsten isn't going to be very forgiving and a crack will start from that tungsten nugget. So you might find a motorcycle frame uh, that's like all TIG welded, it's great, but if that guy who welded the neck onto the motorcycle frame stuck his tungsten in there and you're riding down the freeway, a crack can propagate from that tungsten inclusion. So anytime you stick the tungsten on a part that's going to be like, critical like that, you need to grind the tungsten out of it before you fix it, okay? So that's a time-consuming part. You need to be somewhat skilled. I will say this. We started with the hardest one. This is the hardest welding process. Everything gets easier from here. But the fact that you can do the hardest one means that these other ones are going to come that much faster. So uh, it does take a lot of hand-eye coordination to do this. If you lose your shielding gas, you can get the weld quality goodbye. We talked about like how good TIG welding is and how clean it is, but that's only if you got proper shielding gas. And then uh, <clears throat> the arc starting system, high frequencies can mess with electronics, right? Because they're sending out high frequency electronic pulses, and that's so well. All right, thank you so much for bearing through that.